Did you know that there are all sorts of strange illnesses and diseases that you can catch from kissing? As if dating during a global pandemic wasn't hard enough. If you or someone you care about is trying to navigate the dating scene during these strange times, then stick around because in the next 30 minutes, we are going to help you get up to speed with what you need to know and what you need to ask before kissing someone new. Welcome to C60 Health Connections, where we meet with leading experts in the health and wellness space. Today, we are going to discuss a topic nobody is talking about, weird diseases you can get from kissing with mysterious illness expert, Evan Hirsch, MD. Evan is the founder and CEO of the International Center for Fatigue. Through his best-selling book, podcast, and online programs, he has helped thousands of people around the world resolve their mysterious illnesses, including chronic fatigue and long hauler symptoms, naturally, and he is on a mission to help one million more. My name is Jessica McNaughton, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at C60 Purple Power. I'm a business executive with years of experience in corporate America, and for more than 20 years, I've been exploring various modalities in health, wellness, and spirituality. Now, before we get started, any statements, products, or remedies discussed today have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products or topics discussed today are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent, or mitigate any disease. So with that being said, I'm going to dive right in. Evan, so great to see you. Thank you for joining me today. Jess, thanks so much for having me on. Um, You and I had a chance to catch up recently, and we talked about fatigue and long haulers, and we had some offline conversations, and you dropped some some bombs on me that blew my mind up because we... (laughs) We kind of went off road and we started talking about mysterious kissing diseases. And I remember, you know, being in junior high and high school and people would say, woo, like, look out for mono. Don't get mono. Um, And then, you know, later in life, you know, you want to make sure you don't kiss somebody with a with a cold sore on their mouth. Um, But outside of that, I didn't know all of these other things that you can get when you swap spit with somebody. So... (laughs) I thought it would be so fun to um, to bring you back on and kind of dive into like what's out there because I don't think people know this. I mean, I didn't know this. I know a lot of people just are not clued in and um, now is a great time to help arm our communities with information they need to know about what they might be setting themselves up for in terms of risk if you're going to go kiss a stranger essentially. Yeah. And the, you know, the first time that I learned about this or in hindsight, my understanding is when I met my wife. So I was starting my residency program back in 2004 in family medicine. We met my first month into it. We fell madly in love. And three months later, she couldn't get out of bed. And then three years later, she was mostly better. And then we got married, had a kid. I started a practice. And then a couple of years later, I got chronic fatigue and I couldn't get out of bed. And that lasted for about five years. And what I've learned is that so many times couples come together and they swap spit and they end up swapping infections. And consequently, it was some of the infections that I introduced to her that ended up causing her fatigue. And then some of the ones that she introduced to me that ended up causing my fatigue. And so it really, you know, you can, it it creates, you get this imperfect storm where all of a sudden you just need one more infection in a large quantity where all of a sudden it, it upends um, the human organism. Yeah. All right. So where do we begin? Help us understand, like, what, what do we need to know? How, how would you know? First of all, you said you gave um, some illnesses to your wife and then she reciprocated and gave some back to you. How, how would you know if you think you're healthy? Because I'm assuming you probably thought everything was fine. Right. So the first thing that I always talk about is chronology. You know, what are kind of the steps that led up to this? And so it's always interesting, you know, people who are listening to this, if you got sick or if you feel worse since you met your current partner or any partner that you had, because, you know, even in medical school, we learned that when you sleep with somebody, you're essentially sleeping with everybody that they've ever slept with. Yeah, was that? 
and yeah, and what we were talking about is kissing, which is basically the same thing because yeah. what you're able to transmit is our, we're talking about infections, which could be viral. They could be bacterial. They could be yeast. They could be spirochetes, which are like bacteria that are shaped as spirals. They could be parasites. So, and there are different ways that we acquire some of these things. So we can get things from other people's skin. You can oftentimes there's something called fecal oral, which is somebody wipes their bottom and then they touch you or they touch something or they touch themselves and you touch you. Um, it's not nice to think about, but that's kind of how some things go. If you have a skin infection, that can be transmitted. Anything that you're breathing out, so through your breath, you know, if you're breathing on somebody, you know, this is you know, six feet apart sort of thing that's happened with the pandemic virus. And then there's, you know, somebody sneezes on you. So then there's the mucus component, which is kind of like the swapping spit component too. But any orifice that you have coming out of the nose, out of the mouth, potentially out of the eyes, you know, with pink eyes, somebody rubs their eye. And then, you know, it's on their skin and then they touch you, then you can get that as well. So those are kind of the different routes that we look at. And then there's sexually transmitted, which is more um, semen, usually more men to women, but can go um, the other way. But usually, but at this point, you know, what we're talking about, we're talking more about kissing and some of these other ways of, uh, of getting that transmission of the infection to you. Yeah. Um, I'm a little depressed now. Uh, I'm not, I'm not in, I'm not dating. I have, I have a partner, but I, um, <clears throat> but just even hearing this, you know, you're, op you're opening my mind so much about what's possible. So, um, I, I really want us <laughs> by the end of our conversation, I want to make sure we're helping people feel good about, about, um, you know, their dating journey and I want to arm them with with the right resources and tools. So what do you think we should how do you how do you want to um <clears throat> dive into this? So you like you said viral bacteria, spiral keats, parasites and yeast and then all those things could be um passed either through saliva, breath, sneeze, skin, fecal, oral potentially yes. rubbing your eyes. Yeah, so I mean, big picture, if your body is healthy, then you can kind of um, fight these things off, right? Okay. And when when you think about, so you know, I mean, yes, this is kind of alarming, and you know, this can worry some people. But when you think about it evolutionarily or in nature, mm -hmm. what do animals do in order to determine a mate? Right? What's one of the big components is that they determine whether or not that mate is healthy. Oh, yep, yeah. I thought it was a pop quiz, and I was like, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the answer. I'll make it easy. Good. Thank you. But that's one of the things that we don't do. You know, we've lost our, our our intuition in that realm and also our sense of smell because we have all of these wonderful perfumes and stuff like that, you know. Um, and so it's harder to detect whether or not somebody smells good to us. You know, we're just kind of very divorced from that. Um, so when you say that, are you talking about like a pheromone attraction or are you talking about something else where you might de detect, gosh, their breath kind of smells metallic to me or they just have really bad breath versus somebody that you're kind of drawn to and you're like, wow, you know, great dental um, hygiene, you know? Yeah, I think it's more the latter. Okay. You know, I haven't studied this in detail in terms of like what animals are actually smelling, but usually they're able to smell illness, which is different than smelling pheromones. Okay. Right. So they can still have that attraction, but if there's illness present, which can definitely come from bad breath, or, um, you know, they're sniffing their bottoms, you know, if the bowel movement isn't, you know, high quality, then there could be an issue there as well. So that's just one of the things to just keep in mind here is that we're a little bit misguided. And so when we meet somebody, you know, we have this attraction, there still is the smell there, even though sometimes it's because we like their perfume or their cologne. Um, and then there's, you know, other things obviously that go into it, but we're usually looking past if they have an illness. And so, you know, if somebody has chronic fatigue or has fibromyalgia or has um, Lyme disease or one of these other infections, we don't want to discriminate and we can still love them for, for who they are. And you shouldn't necessarily, I mean, there's all sorts of different ethical things around this, right? We don't want to discriminate against anybody <clears throat> based off of a particular illness that they have. And you, oftentimes you can't control who you fall in love with, right? right. So you just got to take a lot of caveats with this and just really, and we're going to give you some good solutions kind of at the end of this, but it just goes to 
to what I want people to be aware of is, you know, if you had certain symptoms that kind of came up after you got together with somebody, then this might be the kind of thing that you guys have to look at. And oftentimes it's always a mass effect. So if you have heavy metals, chemicals, and molds in your body, and then you kiss somebody who has Epstein-Barr virus and you get mono or a mono type symptom or chronic fatigue, they may not have um, any symptoms, but you will because of the other predisposing conditions that you have, this other stuff that's in your body that's kind of built up over time, right? This is also really interesting between women and men, where oftentimes men are not going to have as severe symptoms as women, where a woman might be sick and a man may not be. And so that's kind of where sometimes it's challenging, especially when it comes to mold. Um, but it, it's hard if your partner is not experiencing the same thing. But not, you know, so many times I would say, you know, 60% of the time, when one partner is ill, the other partner is as well. Um, and so that's something to just be aware of that sometimes it comes from mixing the bugs, you know? Okay. Um, and, you know, when we look back also on my wife and my history, there's certain people that we think about where, you know, I, I have somebody who I dated who now has, you know, fibromyalgia. You know, and so, and we know that infections and toxins can be a big cause of that. And it's like, okay, did, did that go this way? Or did that go that way? Did that come to me? Or did that go to them from me? Did, was there a particular eye infection that I had that I was sharing or were they sharing it with me? And in the end, it doesn't matter, but it's really interesting to kind of think about it. And the same goes for my wife. There's somebody who, you know, she dated who had a, a bunch of certain symptoms, joint pain, um, mouth sores, you know, it was kind of like a lot of those things can be from infections. And maybe that's kind of what got transmitted. Wow. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So if you yourself, so um, if, if, you know, person A has exposure to toxins, so heavy metals, chemicals, mold, and they're dealing with some kind of mycotoxin, just underlying kind of inflammation in their body. And then they start dating person B who has Epstein-Barr, they kiss. Potentially the Epstein-Barr person doesn't really have any kind of reaction, but potentially the person who has all the exposures to all the exposure to the environmental toxins could then get mono or get sick. Absolutely. Wow. That's fascinating. Okay. So it really depends on kind of what's going on in your body plus what's going on in their body. And then when you come together, what, how the, how the chemistry gets kicked off. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's also really important not to blame, Right. you know, because you don't know where you got these bugs from, you know, and maybe it was just the straw that broke the camel's back that you got from your particular partner, or maybe you gave it to them. Like you just don't know. And so you just want to be careful not to blame. Cause I, you know, I, what I just, you know, it didn't sound good to me what I just said, you know, in terms of, of where you get something from, but it's an interesting intellectual conversation and interesting from a safety perspective, but you don't want to blame your partner. It's just right. not good for, uh, okay. for your relationship. So you mentioned <laughs> chronic fatigue, Lyme and fibromyalgia. So are are those specific illnesses are those able to be transmuted through saliva or do you have they are okay yeah and so what's important you were talking about infections and so you know infections are one of these particular causes so when i'm looking at the causes of fatigue which are also the causes of autoimmunity and the causes of fibromyalgia there's 33 potential causes okay and infections are one category of those, okay? And so heavy metals, chemicals, molds, most likely not gonna be transmitted unless you like move into somebody's house and they've got a bunch of molds, right? Right. Um, so heavy metals, chemicals, molds, we talked about infections and then allergies, negative emotional patterns, electromagnetic frequencies, um, all of those are most likely not going to be from um, kissing somebody, but the infections are. And so that's kind of when, when, when we're looking at fatigue and we're looking at autoimmunity, we're looking at fibromyalgia, the mechanism is that the infection gets in the body and it starts damaging, it starts causing stress and it starts damaging the mitochondria. 
So when it starts causing stress in the body, increases inflammation, and depending on where the infection is, that's where the inflammation will be. So if it's in the joints, you get joint pain. And if the immune system is then reacting to this bug and reacting to the joints, you get like rheumatoid arthritis. So you can get these autoimmune conditions. If the infection's in the thyroid, you can get autoimmune thyroiditis or Hashimoto's. If the infection is in the skin, you can get lupus, right? So that's kind of what ends up happening. There's also some molecular mimicry and some other things that are happening, but that's kind of the general idea. And so that's kind of where the, uh, the infections come into play. And so they're, they're causing stress on the body that ends up causing deficiencies in the hormones, especially the adrenals, which are responsible for stress. They damage the mitochondria, which produces about 80 to 90% of all of our energy. Um, and then they're working together with some of these other toxins, the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, and other infections that end up causing this, this whole picture that ends up leading to all of those different issues. But infections are always a big cause or a big contributor to autoimmunity, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia. <clears throat> There's so much there. This is such an important topic. Um, all right, so if you happen to have one of those infections and you know it, do you recommend that people disclose up front? Because I, I, I'm, I'm thinking probably a lot of people don't, you know, you get through, you go through your period of time of dating someone for a while before you <laughs> reveal all information. And, you know, you might kiss somebody before you tell them, you know, I X, Y, Z, you know, has occurred to me in my life and this is what I'm working through. And, you know, um, so can you, I know you're not a dating expert. That's, that's not the context here, but can you give us a, a little bit, our audience, a little bit of coaching on what might be appropriate if you know this about yourself and, or if it comes up in early dating conversation and you learn it about the other person, what's, what's a good way to kind of navigate this and under the context of assuming you want to pursue this relationship. Yeah. Well, I think it's always important to come from a place of thinking about the other person, right? Yeah. You know, it's to your advantage not to tell them, right? Because it's uncomfortable. But if you care about this person, and you want to make sure they're as healthy as possible, then you're going to want to disclose it, right? And it's very possible that, you know, you... Um, you have a conversation with them or you, or you kiss them and, you know, and nothing happens and nothing is transmitted, you know, so that is very possible, but you want to say, Hey, just so you know, this is something that I'm struggling with. I don't know whether or not it can be trans transmitted to you. It is possible. Are you still interested in going down this path? And enough is not known about this where they're going to most likely say yes, because, you know, if they care about you, they're interested in having a relationship with you. It's, it's not going to be a big deal and it's worth the risk, you know, but I do think that when you have the knowledge, it's ethical to disclose it, you know, um, if you don't have the knowledge, obviously you can't disclose it, but I think that that's the ethical way of going about doing it. So I always thought that you just get Lyme disease if a tick bites you, but it sounds like if a tick bit me and I had it, I could also give it to my partner then. Correct. That just blows my mind. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, the volume, okay. you know, like what is the inoculation? You know, like when you're bitten by a tick or you're getting the, you know, Lyme disease in a particular way, oftentimes you're getting a big inoculation in addition to having all those predisposing factors. Okay. If, you know, but somebody else, if you're kissing them, the question is, you know, how much is actually being transmitted? We know that it can be found in saliva, but we don't know, like, what is that, what does that volume look like? You know, and if, if it, if it goes into their body and their immune system is able to fight it off, that's great. You know, but if you're partying um, for seven days straight and your immune system is compromised or that person also has the, the pandemic virus, um, you know, then there, there might be other things at play. Or if they've got these predisposing factors, you know, then um, there might be a consequences. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's not a guarantee, but it is possible that you can transmit it. Correct. Okay. Okay, what are some of the other infections that people should have an awareness about that could possibly be transmitted? And let's let's expand this. We're um, let's. I don't want to get into the sexually transmitted diseases because that's a whole it's a whole different topic, and a lot of people have an awareness about those. But um, you you mentioned 
breath, um, and you know, we certainly could, or, or sneezing, uh, we're talking about saliva and mucus. Let's talk about skin too. Sure. So in, well, let's start with skin. So, you know, gram positive bacteria are commonly found on the skin. Sometimes people will have, um, boils, you know, which are basically like underground zits or pus pockets like abscesses um, that can come from something called MRSA or methicillin staphylococcus resistant um, uh, organism. Um, methicillin resistant staph A, yeah, staphylococcus aureus. And so basically that's a gram positive organism that is resistant to antibiotics. And so, you know, from your skin to somebody else's skin, they could also have the issue, but oftentimes it is accompanied by an immune system that's dysfunctional because you make the immune system better, you give them vitamin D, you start going, you start treating it. We use herbs because everything we do is 100% natural in order to practice. Uh, across state lines, I operate as a health coach and we use very powerful herbs in order to get things done. But that's one of the things oftentimes. And then like some of the other things that we talked about, like, the skin being a vehicle for transmission. So, you know, you rub your eyes and you have a virus that's in the eye, pink eye or something like that, um, it can also be bacterial. So you can get conjunctivitis or um, conjunctivitis rather from bacteria or from a virus, you rub your eye, you touch somebody else and they can do that. Or if you're, if somebody's wiping their bottom and there's something that's, um, that then gets transmitted from the skin. People, wash your hands, soap and water, hot soap and water, 20, 30 seconds. Yeah. And so, and I'm also, you know, a fan of carrying, um, a, you know, a natural um, antibiotic or, um, you know, this is a natural hand sanitizer. This one mm -hmm. is by Cleanwell and it's thyme oil so that, you know, you can just kind of spray your hands when you're going in and out of places. It's especially helpful right now with the, with the pandemic. Awesome. So that's, that's skin. Some okay. of these other infections, you know, if we're looking at some of the viruses, mono or mononucleosis, you know, the quote unquote kissing disease can come from a number of different viruses. So we normally think of it coming from Epstein-Barr virus, but you can also get it from cytomegalovirus. You can get it from HHV6, which is a herpes virus. And a herpes, when we talk about herpes, we're not talking about just the cold sores on the mouth, which is herpes one, or on the genitals, which is a herpes simplex virus number two. You, there's a whole category of what are considered herpes viruses. So it, they don't have to be sexually transmitted to be in that virus, in that uh, family. Um, but those can be transmitted as well. And they can, oftentimes the symptoms are, are, um, are pretty nonspecific. So you can have fatigue, you can have uh, sh not shortness of breath, but sore throat. You can have large lymph nodes. Those are usually what you're looking at. Then there's some of the more Lyme type organisms. So Borrelia is otherwise known as Lyme disease, not Lyme's disease. It's not belonging to Lyme, even though it is from Lyme, Connecticut. Um, but Borrelia, in order to have that, you really have to have two symptoms. You have to have symptoms that move around the body and this could be joint pain, muscle pain, or nerve pain, like numbness, tingling, or electric shocks that moves around the body. Like maybe today it's in the left wrist and the next week it's in the right knee. And then symptoms that come and go or in terms of their severity. So some days are worse than others where you may want to schedule a visit with your friend, but you're too concerned because you don't know whether it's going to happen on a bad day. So if you don't have those symptoms, you really can't have Borrelia. And then there's something like um, something called Bartonella, which is a bacteria that is found in upwards of 50% of all domestic animals. So this is another way that you can get some of these infections is being licked by your animal. So dog or cat kisses are maybe going to give you this. Oh man, this is so depressing. You can't even get puppy kisses anymore. Yeah. <laughs> And so that is something to think about too, is, you know, did you get worse when you got a particular animal? Cause I've seen people, they're like, we got this animal. Like when I asked them, they didn't really realize it, but it's like, Hey, any association with a sick animal? They're like, you know what? We had this animal that had like all this joint pain. It was really sick. And then we got rid of the animal and then we felt so much better, you know? And so that's one of the things that's, that's a struggle for us actually right now is because we have an older cat who's 15 years old and she's limping along, 
but she's got a number of different medical issues. And I call her my Bartonella baby because I know that she's just, you know, part of the infections that I had and my wife had, like we had Bartonella and we, we know she's just dripping it, you know? So it's one of those things where it's like, all right, now it's time to, for us, you know, do we euthanize her? Do we not? It's just a hard decision that we're struggling with right now. But, you know, we do not let, you know, if there, if there are kisses that are coming from the animals, we make sure we wash our hands before we touch our face, right? So that is Bartonella. And you can get symptoms like pain on the bottom of the feet or in the feet. It could be on the bottom, could be on the top. Sometimes it's burning. Sometimes it's just discomfort. Sometimes it's when you get out of bed in the morning, you really want to put on those slippers because your feet are so sensitive. Oftentimes people are also having cramping in the calves, usually at night, it can be in other, other muscle groups as well, but usually it's in the calves. And then there's thyroid issues that play along with this because Bartonella likes to get into the thyroid. There can be headaches, neck pain, body pain, problems sleeping, whether it's falling asleep or staying asleep, anxiety or depression. And sometimes people get Bartonella striae, or it's basically like a rash that looks like um, a, a scratch or maybe like a stretch mark. Um, so, and you don't have to have all those symptoms, but oftentimes if somebody has a hard time sleeping, maybe pain on the feet with some muscle cramps and they don't have to happen every day, they can happen every couple of days, every couple of weeks, that can be a really significant sign that Bartonella is at play. Wow. Another one, you okay with me keep going like this? Yeah, no, because I this is great. It's really, really informative. <clears throat> Another one is Babesia. So this is considered the North American malaria. It is an intracellular organism. So it goes inside the cell and it will cause spontaneous sweating sometimes during the day, sometimes at night. So that could be night sweating where you wake up in the middle of the night and you have shortness of breath and sweating because it also causes shortness of breath. And then sleep is usually quite bad. So problems falling asleep and stay and or staying asleep. And it's usually the sleep is worse than with Bartonella. And then the mood stuff is worse than Bartonella as well. So the anxiety can be to the point of panic attacks. The depression can be to the point of suicidal thoughts. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of these symptoms that we've already talked about with the viruses, with the Bartonella, with the Babesia can also be from the pandemic virus. I'm not going to say the word because of censorship, right. yep. but the, the pandemic virus can cause a number of these symptoms, over 200 different symptoms it's been associated with. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it travels in the blood. And so anywhere that it gets to, it can cause inflammation and cause these symptoms. And there was one study that looked retrospectively at like an electronic medical record from doctor's offices at 265,000 different people. And for people who got the virus, six months later, 35% of them had a, di had a mental health diagnosis. So they were diagnosed then with anxiety or depression. So some of these symptoms can come from that virus, but we also know that this virus can also operate as a biofilm disruptor, which basically means that it is breaking the, um, some of the hiding places of some of these infections. And so that's when, if you all of a sudden you start sweating, it could be from the virus, but it could also be from Babesia popping out. And so when we go through our process and we are addressing the virus, sometimes we also have to address some of these things. We call it the whack-a-mole effect, where some of these bugs pop out when you get some of these other bugs and you have to address them. Them. And so that's Babesia. Um, and, you know, oftentimes people with Babesia, they're usually the hottest person in the room. And I forgot to mention this with, with Bartonella, but they're usually the coldest person in the room. They got cold hands, cold feet. People with, Bar with Babesia are usually the hottest person in the room. Oftentimes they're saying, hey, you know, is the heat on? They're, and they're, you know, if they got to go outside and shovel, they're the one in t-shirt, right? Yeah. So they're usually quite warm. So that's Babesia. And then um, those are kind of the main ones. Then there's yeast, where oftentimes if you get anal itching or itching in the ears, that can really indicate yeast or it can indicate mold. And then when it comes to parasites, you don't always actually see parasites in your stool, but any sort of gut issue that you have can be from parasites or it can be from yeast, actually. So this might be constipation. This might be bloating. This might be, you may think it's SIBO or small intestinal bowel, bowel um, bacterial overgrowth, but it actually might be from parasites. Um, getting worse around the full moon. We just had the- Why, why, why does it get worse around the full moon? Can you explain that to me? 
Yeah. So any sort of crazy symptom that gets around the full moon. So a lot of it has to do with pressure. Yeah. Pressure changes. Yeah. With parasites. And it can be from other infections as well, but most of the time it's parasites and it just has to do with, I don't know. It, yeah, it feeds them or I don't entirely understand, but it can be diagnostic and can determine on what, you know, if you have a sleeping problem that gets worse during this time, it could be from parasites, Babesia or Bartonella. So those are kind of some of the important ones to, uh, to keep an eye out for, but any mystery symptom that you have oftentimes has some sort of infectious component. And that's why I never wanted to treat infections. I never wanted to treat mold, but I kept seeing these people that I didn't have answers for. So I had to dive in there because then all of a sudden I could help these people. And uh, unfortunately, infections are a huge problem, these chronic infections, and not enough people are talking about it because they can contribute to pretty much almost any illness, everything from heart attack, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, right, to chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and whatnot. So important to think about. Okay, so we know people could have multiple illnesses going on at the same time. And it's like you said, there's a whack-a-mole process where you start to fix one and then another one pops up and then you get that under control and then maybe another one pops up. So <clears throat> give us a little bit of good news here though, Evan. Like I know that these things are, you know, you can work through this with some natural healthy lifestyle choices, some changes to your diet, right? Like if you think you have this and, and you're like, oh man, or you think the person that you're dating, you know, might be dealing with some of this, uh, or you can think back into your past and, and, you, and you can definitely identify, you know, people that you've cared about having some of these issues. Um, where do you start? And we're going to put all of your links and p- ways for people to get in touch with you um, in, in our show notes. But like, what's, what's step one um, to like go after addressing some of these issues? Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you a couple of things. So the first thing is, you know, we've got a four-step process that we take people through where the first step is to assess which causes they actually have of those 33 different causes. Yeah. Then the second step is to replace the deficiencies because these causes can be broken up into deficiencies and toxicities and the infections are in the toxicity section, but we want to make the body as strong as possible. So we replace the deficiencies, then we open up the detoxification pathways, which are like the exits for the body, for the toxicities. And so we want to make sure that there's ways for these toxicities to get out of the body. And then we remove the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections, the allergies, the negative emotional patterns, electromagnetic frequencies et cetera, et cetera. So all these toxicities that we have to get out of the body. Now, when you go through this process and you've got a partner, you just have them take the drops that you're taking. And sometimes they don't, I mean, they don't have to do the ramp up or anything like that, but just to decrease the amount that, that they're exposing you to, because, you know, it doesn't work if we're just treating one partner and then the partner goes and kisses the other partner, right? Then they're just being exposed again. And so, you have to, we have to decrease the volume of what is present in both individuals. And so that's one of the things that we find to be really helpful. Um, you know, the other thing is that this stuff is all really treatable. You just have to, we use herbs that are really powerful. Um, but, and the reason why we like to do that is because we like to shift things and we like to make sure that people are having success, but you have to address all these other things as well, right? We said that it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. So you have to make sure heavy metals, chemicals, and molds are also being addressed so that you can be more successful. Um, you know, a uh, quick story about what we're going to call this person, Jenny, you know, and she had an awful time sleeping when she came to see us. She had panic attacks and she had spontaneous sweating. And so she had Babesia. And we put her on some of these tinctures that we use and we just started ramping up on the drops really, um, really gently. And while, you know, while this, we had gone through the four step process. And so step three had enough of the, we opened up those detoxification pathways to deal with what's called die off. So as the bugs die, they release toxins into the body, the immune system sees it and reacts to it. And so if you can deal with that process, then you can really accelerate the treatment that you're doing. And so what she found, was she went from having hot flashes every single day and this awful sleep to, you know, every time we increased a drop every week, all of a sudden there was a significant, like a 10% decrease in her symptoms, you know, where after a couple of months, the, the hot flashes or the, the spontaneous sweating was happening like once every couple of weeks, the sleep was like 90% better, 
you know, the panic attacks were all but gone. It's really amazing what ends up happening when you actually are able to understand who's present, you know, which infection is present, and then how to go after that in a, in a safe way and making sure that the person is well supported through that process. That's a, so powerful. <clears throat> so do you think, um, you'd mentioned at the beginning, you know, one of the, one of the things that you can look for is kind of, kind of tapping back into your own intuition and just kind of using some common sense around ob observing whether or not the person that you're considering, you know, getting into a relationship with is healthy. And if they aren't, then having some, you know, productive kind of open-ended conversations around that. Do you think it's important for for people, <clears throat> especially in today's day and age, if they're just starting out dating, to look to find a partner who they have an alignment of not only like values and standards, but a similar vision around kind of like what the ideal outcomes would be for a healthy lifestyle together. Absolutely. I mean, if you're going to take a look, I mean, it really depends on your priorities, right? Okay. You know, like if you, you know, there's several different aspects. And like you said, I'm not a relationship expert, expert but I know that, you know, my really, you know, one of the reasons why my relationship with my wife, wife works really good is because we're both really interested in optimizing our health. You know, we're both gluten-free. She'd been gluten-free 10 years before I even met her. You know, we're both gluten-free, dairy-free. We prioritize spending money on organic food and on our health. We both sp spend money the same way right? We, we have very different love languages, but we're open to growth, right? So, you know, there's a number of these things that, you know, you just have to, you know, if you're still looking for a partner right now, you want to make sure that you're writing down all the things you're looking for because, right, you write it down and it's a lot more likely to come to fruition. But you just have to figure out what are your values. Yep. My wife actually has a, um, a values program that she's working on um, as part of the work that she does. But you, you need to know what your values are and what's important to you. And then you want to find somebody who kind of matches that. So you can have these conversations and you, you know, marriage is hard enough and you just want to be aligned on the things that are most important for you. That's so, that's so true. It's such a good reminder too, because I think, uh, in the dating scene, you know, people just try to like focus on the attraction and the chemistry part and, you know, on paper, does this person look good? But what really sustains lasting relationships are making sure that there's an alignment, you know, with values and standards and morals and that you have a similar vision for your future. And right now, the you know, everyone for the first time, I think, collectively, uh, we're all, you know, needing to rally around understanding our health and, and really taking care of our health protecting our health and getting in front of some of these things. So I know we're short on time today and I don't want to keep you any longer. I so appreciate you being here. It's such a fun conversation. I'm going to have to have you back again because there's a hundred more questions I want to ask you about all these issues. But the good news is um, there is help. There are solutions. If you have any of these things or your partner has these things or you're swapping illnesses back and forth, um, get in touch with Evan and learn more about these topics. All of his information will be linked in our show notes below. Evan, do you want to leave us with any parting words of wisdom? Well, I just wanted to actually talk a little bit about C60. So, you know, one of our favorite things to use for boosting mitochondrial energy, as well as I've actually seen warts go away from taking higher doses of C60, among other things. And so it's antioxidant effects can also and it have antiviral properties. And so that's one of the things that's really nice to get it into the mix. Awesome. Well, thank you for your positive feedback on, on C60. We always appreciate that. Uh, we will see you next time. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. And Evan, thanks so much for your time. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now. Bye.